Hi there. Marcus here. We're doing, talking about research matters again. I've got prof Associate Professor or Professor? Associate Professor. Associate Professor Francesca Riccati here. He's at the ANU or the Australian National University, which is about as good as you can get in Australia in terms of climbing the pyramids of power and learning and everything. And he's um, a wonderful historian and cultural person. He's professor, uh, associate professor of Italian as well. And your research has combined Italian early experiences in Australia with Indigenous Australians, and it's been spreading further from that. So I'm going to ask you to say a little bit more about yourself first, Francesca, before I ask you these questions. Okay, thank you, Marcus, for inviting me, and it's very nice to be able to talk to you again. Um, yeah, my research is mostly on Italian migration history, but at some point um, I thought, you know, I should really engage with the complex topic of Italian migrants, yeah. you know, being on indigenous land and, and what are the implications for, you know, decolonizing Italian migration and so on. So in recent years, I've done quite a lot of work on, on that, on trying to rewrite Italian the history of Italian migration to Australia in a way that acknowledge the reality of uh, where we are and what the history of uh, these countries. And um, I also teach Italian, as you were saying. So part of my work is also around thinking about different ways of doing history that takes into consideration transcultural memories and how memory and history work across cultures rather than in isolation within an imaginary single culture. Yeah, so I mean, that's really interesting to me because memory is one of the things as a, because I work as a futurist as well as an historian, it's key to shaping the way we imagine futures is the way, is that flow of memory. So it's, it's very- Yes, a, a friend used to say, Paolo Bartoloni, a professor in Ireland, used to talk about remembering forward, you know, this need to think about the past and to remember our lives and the lives of our community, but always thinking about the present and the future, not just about the past. Yeah, yeah. So that's beautiful. So that gives you all a little taste of where Francesca, that and the sort of work he does. I have to say that, you know, one of the papers of yours that I use every year with my students and I and I return to is your truth and the feeling, that truth as feeling. And I remember we were colleagues at the time of you working that and you were, found it's so hard to find a, a journal that would take it because it was so, so unusual in terms of an academic piece, but to me, the thought, it's a thought piece that's really profound, but also very useful in, in the way that I work. So I just wanted to acknowledge that thing because I think it's a terrific paper. Thank you, Marcus. And yes, that's, that's, a, that's been a, a recurring issue throughout my career, you know, where, you, where can you publish things that tend to work, you know, across cultures and across disciplines? And, and really challenge the idea of discipline itself. And, uh, you know, often many of our colleagues are also gatekeepers of their beloved disciplines. And so it makes it yeah. a little bit hard sometimes to find the right, the right journals. Yeah. Now, I, I have that problem too. We're trying to, I'm trying to get a, an article published at the moment and the reviewer keeps coming back with, but, 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 <laughs> I'm going. <laughs> Oh, yeah, and, 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 you know, we should all acknowledge the fact that the world is complex. So there is always something you haven't talked about, some author you haven't cited. And, uh, exactly. you know, sometimes they use it as an excuse to to really attack your uh, multidisciplinary approach, because there is always a but that you can criticize an article with. And But that's what makes me interested in your work is it's multi or even transdisciplinary nature and it's very hard to discreetly separate let's say Italian migration from indigenous relations from language from memory uh, which of course leads you into the anthropological as well so you've got history you've got language you've got memory you've even got psychology or social psychology you've got all these things coming together yes. so I mean 
let, let's let's get down to uh, to the purpose of our discussion in a sense. You know, what do you see that given that you're in a university, a very prestigious university, and you've got you, you're still struggling to get heard or get heard in certain spaces. What do you feel is the purpose of research, Francesca? Well, that's a very complex question. Um, I guess for me, the, the main purpose of research is not really a clear utilitarian one. Um, I think that a lot of people in academia, but also in the world in general, really struggle with complexity. You know, they don't really feel comfortable with complexity. And because we live in a very complex world, the result of that is they look for shortcuts, you know, and that might be paranoid thinking, that might be a very rigid way of thinking and understanding the world. Um, yeah. a dogmatic way and I think that that doesn't really help all of us living in community and with some happiness so for me the 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 the, the main goal of research at least in the humanities the space where we work in is to try to make people more comfortable with complexity mm -hmm. you know and that's the same with teaching and that means for me, that means to provide stories and histories and memories that, you know, go beyond what usually we hear yeah. or, or discuss or understand, you know, to show other people that there are other perspectives, other ways to understand the world, other ways to, to be alive. Um, and, and so that's for me is, is the goal, you know, to to contribute not as an individual scholar, but together with a community of scholars to try and make people a little bit more comfortable about complexity, you know, and accept that in complexity, there is also a beauty and possibilities that are extraordinary and we should embrace. Yeah, no, very nice. Uh, yeah, I, I, I really feel that complexity is something to be embraced, not rejected or, or, or pushed aside because it's too difficult. Mm. So you, um, you're, you've often conducted interviews and, and sort of that kind of engagement with the raw sources of, of data. How do you approach your research overall? Of course, so there are techniques, let's say, like oral history techniques. And I remember that you ran a course once here at my university on oral history. Um, how do you approach this, Francesca? Well, again, I, I think, you know, one of the things that I have always uh, struggled with is this idea that, uh, you know, you kind of uh, learn or appropriate a specific methodology and then you just apply that and you see the results. Mm -hmm. I understand that that works very well uh, for many scholars in many disciplines, but to me, it, will, it was always difficult to just, you know, accept the idea that you can understand such a complex world through a methodology that inevitably um provides guidance but also rather rigid boundaries so in my work what i try to do is to mix things so you know i've worked on transcultural studies uh, par participatory research oral history language studies ethnography autoethnography um at the core of it for me is to find and share interesting stories and to think carefully you know to take the time uh, and the energy to think carefully about those beautiful stories mm. and you can do that in many different ways to me maybe because of the kind of education i had you know i strongly believe in art in literature in creative way of thinking and uh, this is not always easy for academics, but I think it's a good reminder for all of us that, uh, you know, art has an ability to engage with that complexity that, uh, you know, we, we can also sometimes use. So I try to develop my methodology around 
the people I'm working with as well, because I think another problem of rigid methodologies is that you then forget the person you have in front of you. And, uh, and, and, and then you inevitably end up forgetting their stories as well. And so there are people who are very comfortable with uh, oral history, but there are other people whose stories require a different approach, I think. So I try to adapt so that I can develop a dialogue between myself and, and the people, the participants I'm working with. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And it, as I'm hearing you, my, my translation is that you're searching for the human. In a, in a sense, it's a quest for the the humanity of, that you're dealing with. Yeah, the humanity in relation, you know, obviously there is there is a relation between me and the person I'm working with and the community I'm working within. But more and more often, I also find myself wondering about, you know, that complexity of the world that is not just social and uh you know how we all engage with uh, with trees with the sea with with our environment yeah. i mean i'm not an environmental historian but i do think that there are very interesting stories to be found to be found for instance in the way italian and greek migrants have engaged with uh figs and tomatoes and their own veggie gardens but also how that also signal an appropriation of a of a space and an environment that actually uh, should be owned and controlled by the indigenous people and their wisdom and so you know that those complex stories are stories of human engagement but they're also stories of human engagement with nature if you want to yep. simplify or with the environment and in all its complexity so this is really something i'm quite interested to explore right now yeah so that i mean i'm really happy to hear that because to me looking at the way the human and our, our cultures that we bring with us interface with the environment is is a key interest but it's also extremely important to understand this in our own current time you know with people talking about the anthropocene or whatever it is you know how we want to describe that so your work that is very very relevant in that space yeah and again it's uh the result in part i mean this new kind of thing that i'm trying to do is also the results of my own experience of you know there was a particularly difficult time in my life recently and um i found a lot of uh respite walking around Melbourne at the time and and looking for fig trees because fig trees always make me very happy especially when you know the fruit is is there yeah. to be taken and eaten <laughs> um and so I was reflecting on that you know ability of the trees to really make me happy and seeking the trees but also again the fact that then you also see traces of you know, the indigenous cultures in places like Melbourne's. And, and then you have to wonder what the tree, the fig tree imported from Italy uh, is actually doing there, you know, and it's doing good thing, but it's also signaling at least a history of, of this possession um, yeah. that we need to, to deal with. Yeah, that's very true. And of course, there's the, the other side is that for the immigrant, it's a mark of continuity. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, uh, a, a wonderful scholar, Joseph Pugliese, has also written about how that continuity is an historical continuity that often goes beyond your life, both in the future, but also in the past. So, for example, he talks about the, the prickly pear and, and how that is typical of southern Italy. So it built a continuity for migrants and children of migrants, you know, between Calabria and Australia. But, you know, it also came to Calabria from a history of colonialism and imperialism and, and the travel that these plants 
have made across the world, you know? So, so there is a, a, a much longer continuity. It's a continuity of our life and family and community, but often also, you know, a much longer history. That's beautiful. And yeah, I, I, I really uh, appreciate that dimension of, I guess, historical, geographical, and cultural thinking. I mean, they mix, mix and obviously anthropological, as you said as well. So just to, to wrap things up, you know, what would you, what would be a piece of advice you would give to uh, somebody beginning their research career? <laughs> 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 so the first thing that came to my mind was don't do it well that's, that's <laughs> the second person i've asked who said something very similar <laughs> well i'm just joking i mean doing research is amazing but we do live in a system that doesn't make it easy <laughs> um so my advice would be first of all you know make sure that really is your passion and what you want to do in life Remember that you can do research as an academic, but you can do research in many other professions. Yeah. So I think you can train to become a researcher. It doesn't necessarily mean that you need to work in academia. In fact, I think, you know, the rest of our society really need the skills that researchers develop. And uh, what, what I would recommend is really to, uh, you know, follow your passion and also i don't know i i do struggle a little with uh, scholars who uh, as i was saying before apply one specific methodology very rigidly so that they can be very productive yep. and very successful in this job I think we need to challenge that. And I think the best way to challenge that is to always remember that you are part of a community and you are working with communities. Mm -hmm. And anything that is too rigid is going to uh, wound a community rather than heal it. That's and so, you know, when we think about how our job, our research can <laughs> contribute to community, we need to be very careful uh, that we take time, you know, and this is contrary to what students are often told, not by you, of course, but, you know, that they need to produce, that they need to publish, that they need to uh, show that their research is very innovative. And this is all, of course, very important if you want to have a job. But at the same time, I think we need to remember that we are here to work with communities, not against communities for our own sake. Yeah, no, that's very, very important, Francesco. I appreciate you saying that because research is not in and of itself just some personal self gratification. We're actually researching to enable intercultural thinking or whatever. There's from, in my mind, there's an aspect of advocacy work that's there, that we are seeking to better understand the human condition or the human nature relationship or, you know, the relationship between different cultures, which is a, a lot of the work that you do. Yes, and we have to remember as well that even if we are not activists, we, most of us are also teachers. Yes. And you cannot, you cannot teach what you preach, but don't practice you know and so when you shift from research to teaching let's say that you teach let's say that you research social justice you know then you shift into being a teacher of social justice you know if your research does not honestly embrace social justice then what are you going to teach to students you know so your research has to also always intersect with uh with teaching and 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 to do so you need to be honest about what you are doing as a researcher or i don't think you will be a honest teacher either that's great yeah and for me actually teaching is a form of research in its own right i'm I, i'm always reflecting and honing and crafting the teaching because it's engaging with human beings again yeah absolutely. very much a human process 
you know, I really appreciate you giving me this time, Francesco. That was lovely. Yeah. So thank you very much. And um, I look forward to having another conversation with you at some time. I'll have to invent some other excuse. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we don't need... Well, we don't need excuses. We Let's just meet for a coffee when we are in the same city at some point. Well, well you've gone to Canberra now. I, 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 I don't often get to Canberra. But anyway, take care. Thank you so much. You too. And, uh, I really appreciate you giving us this time. Okay. Bye, Max. Mm -hmm. There we go.